Okay, so it's time to wrap up a little bit. So what have we done? What, especially, um, what are the open issues? So what are things which are kind of research topics in um, the context of SLAM? And I um, also would like to discuss the evaluation, so at least have the results in relation to from Friday. Uh, so what have we done? This course was all about simultaneous localization mapping problem, which in the end is just focused on estimating this probability distribution. So distribution about the robots poses and the map given sensor observations and given um, control commands that were provided to the robot. And um, the problem, why it is quite tricky, say a symmetric problem, the reason is that this state space is kind of high dimensional. So depending on the representation that I use, the map can be quite high dimensional if you think about a grid map or if you have a lot of landmarks. And also depending on how far the robot traveled, this x0 to t may be a high dimensional vector. And the problem is to actually how to do this high dimensional estimation problem in an efficient way. And the problem that we have in the state space is um, that if we, if we know the poses, building the map is easy. And having a map estimating the robot's pose is easy, or at least not too difficult. The problem arises when the both quantities which strongly depend on each other are unknown. And therefore, it's why it's called simultaneous localization of mapping. And um, so if we go back, so there's a strong dependency between those two variables. If one of them is known, it's easy. If both are unknown, it can be tricky. And we looked into maybe three frameworks. And these are kind of the three key frameworks which exist today. Now, there are a few variants, slightly different approaches. But these are the big three building blocks that we um, have today. So everything started, the slam thing started with color filters, the first technique people were using. This was you know, realization of the base filter, which makes the assumption that everything is Gaussian, and then tries to estimate this as a joint Gaussian distribution. Um, we looked into particle filter-based techniques, especially fast slam and the grid-based variant of fast slam, which are there are a few other approaches as well um, on particle filtering, where, for example, particles share maps or have a nice way for having the map management to, in order to be able to deal with larger maps. But they haven't been they have been successfully published, successfully used, but um, the both approaches I presented here are the most commonly used ones in terms of particle filter based slam. Um, and the advantage here was that we can have non Gaussian distributions. We can deal with multiple data association hypotheses quite elegantly. Uh, the limit of this approach is that it um, potentially requires a large number of samples. It mainly depends on what the uncertainty of the particle filter should represent on its way. So how far are the particles spread out? Is the area of relevant uncertainty densely enough covered with samples? If this is the case, it's a nice approach. If this is not the case, it's just random that the approach works. So if you're supporting it in the right spot, yes or no. And um, you may lose track of good particles and your filter may diverge. It's one of the problem of particle filter-based approaches. The graph-based approaches are also actually quite old. They're definitely older than the particle filter-based approaches but just became kind of popular, say, 2005, 2006, 2006 on in the, in the SLAM community, and people started to use it frequently. Um, one reason for that is that the mathematical toolkits which are available so solve to deal with these sports matrices have improved. So if you, because if you want to solve the linear system with a complete dense matrix, it gets intractable quite quickly, so you need the sparse matrix libraries in the sparse transcript of decomposition or something like that. Um, and they've improved over time, especially recently. Um, and so these are tools which are now available, and the graph-based um, formulation has become quite attractive, or it's currently, I would say, the most frequently used ones. It has some advantages, which I actually would like to elaborate with you in a few minutes, so just to also repeat a few things about the three classes of approaches and try to identify what were the advantages and disadvantages of the individual. We looked into two variants of the SLAM problem. One is the, the graphical model for the full SLAM problem, where we're interested in estimating the map and the whole trajectory of the robot. So the full SLAM here refers to we're interested in the full trajectory of the robot. And this is kind of the uh, graph-based SLAM approach, one 
typical way of these um, of the full slider problem. The alternative is to see that okay, so to see that as an online slider problem, but I'm only interested in the core of the, the latest pose of the robot and the map of the environment if I'm not interested in the old poses. And this can be seen as marginalizing out the old variables in here. So kind of um, the common filter, at least the common filter, how we discussed it here in the course, is um, the way for doing online slang, uh, for doing yeah, um, online slang here. Um, and this also brings to one of the advantages, uh, disadvantages of the common filter with respect to the graph-based approach, because both actually work on, on Gaussian distributions. Um, the advantage of keeping all the poses is that, in the, as the graph-based formulation does it, that they can relinearize. Relinearize. So um, I need to linearize my error function, and the linearization depends on the, on the, on the current configuration we have. In the common filter, I cannot uh, do the linearization again. Once it's linearized, it there, it integrates it into the filter, and there's no way for it redoing the linearization. Where the graph-based approach can do that. In every step of the iteration, we can uh, have to uh, linearize again, and this, therefore, is typically um, leads to better, much better map estimates and is less likely to lead to filter divergence um, compared to the common filter. It's one of the advantages. So what you should have learned in that course, if you prepare for the exam, see this as a kind of a checklist you also have to, to look into. Um, the first thing is you should have an understanding what the slam problem is, what are, why is it difficult, and what are the different variants we have for what are different assumptions that we typically do? What are um, different ways to treat that? What kind of observation models do exist? So how does it impact the estimation? For example, um, if I blind marks, what kind of uh, bearing on the observations, I've ranked bearing observations, um, or what happens with the grid maps? What are the underlying assumptions out of the grid map? Mapping with normal poses. If landmarks or grid base, given the posts are known, it's easy to know how this is done. Um, then we, look, we start with EKF SLAM, kind of the real standard first slam, successful SLAM approach that was used. Um, we also looked, we haven't touched the EKF, EKF, the <coughs> UKF, sorry, but uh, not having done that completely for SLAM, I then looked into the SIFE, which is one of the um, also advanced techniques that builds on the um, common filter framework, but it does the filtering in, in information space and have the advantage that you could do a couple of approximations to actually make that a roughly constant time algorithm, which is always a desired property. Um, so at least the update is more or less constant time. It's mean, so a fully constant time due to some approximations which are done in there and some iterative methods on how to recover the mean, for example. Um, so it wasn't perfectly constant time, but approximately constant time. Um, then you should know how the particle filter works, how the particle filter general works, what the idea of the particle filter, and then especially what we, what we need to do in order to make it applicable for in the context of the slam problem. So this was, for example, raw equalization was the key trick which was used in here to separate the estimation of the map from the estimation of the trajectory, and then use only the particle filter-based representation for the trajectory, and then solve the map learning problem given the trajectory, which is then much easier. Um, and then, of course, graph-based slam approaches here. We looked into the Gauss-Newton approach. We very briefly discussed it in Mac Marquardt, um, stochastic gradient descent-based techniques. So you should actually know what are the properties of these techniques, how do they work, what is the key essence of these methods. Um, also, very critical to front ends, although I'm aware that um, we could also do a full course on front ends. Um, just, it's very sensor dependent, very much dependent on the quality of your sensor, on the different properties. Um, so the whole literature is on just how good that is. Monocular cameras, what does change with stereo cameras? So there's, there's a lot of stuff also going on in the context of front ends. And what was more important for me this time that you actually gain some hands on experience, um, so programming experience and how to build some app systems. We focus mainly on the back ends, but you uh, here is not that much on the front ends, but you should have learned um, what makes a common filter a common filter. You should have implemented the graph-based slam system to know how that works. So, and you should have know how or implemented how to build grid maps, for example. So there were a lot of things that I regard as important 
Um, if you do it on your own, because, or if you, if you especially code it, because a lot of the kind of fallbacks or problems are really identify if you have to um, put that into program code. Or at least it was my experience when I learned all that, that only after I've coded it, I kind of have the feeling that I fully understood what's going on. And I hope to provide you this here in the course, and therefore, since I know it was quite some programming, programming work, uh, the design decision that we did in the course, and a lot of credits go to uh, Marana and Nicola for that. And they actually tried to build up a framework that you were not that. Uh, their duty was not to do what we rather call the boring path, right? How to read log files, how to plot all the stuff. It's relevant, but it's something which often distracts or is more work than focusing on the main algorithms. And therefore, um, they spend a lot of time actually building up that framework and use that um, so that you hopefully could concentrate on the most important ones. And my, one of the key goals that I think actually achieved that, or at least given from the feedback we got also from the exercises um, on your capability, is that you should now be able actually to understand the average slam paper. So if you go to a, the, the web and Google for slam, whatever, graph-based approach, and look for a recent paper published this year or last year on one of the major conferences, you should actually be able to understand it. Perhaps not, in the, not all the perfect details, but you should have a pretty good overview um, on how that works and I believe that you will understand most of those papers. Of course, some are really hard to understand, don't expect to understand everything until the, the last details, but um, I hope I gave you enough material that you're able to understand the average time paper. I also identified what other things the authors did not talk about, what are potential drawbacks of the approach, to kind of have a, quite some background knowledge to evaluate what the good approach is. Please. And do you think you could let me put one or two papers on the lecture page and say, okay, if you have time and if, or if you have enough time, then you could use this as like a check, okay, this is, you should probably understand it or something. Um, yeah, so I mean, even if you if you look back to the course material I present, I always had the kind of literature there and the PDF files are on the website for oh, all okay. the material that was here. So can actually go back and go into the details how this is written. Um, so these you should understand because this is something material I also covered. But I think you can now also go a step beyond. And um, I, I'm happy to put something else online if, if this is desired. But at least there are kind of 10 papers or something like this on the website that you should be able to understand. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the my goals, that what you should have learned in that course. And so what is also important is um, comparison of all these approaches. And so typically, if you find all the table, there's such a table in the end of the course, oh, the plus here, minus here for the individual approaches. But this is something which vanishes quite quickly from um, brain, from student brains. So therefore, my idea was here to now derive that here together with you. So at least you, you can also you can see that as kind of something that um, you, or if it's very easy for you to, to identify the bottlenecks now, that's a pretty good sign. I'm very happy about that. Um, of course, it's quite a while ago that we talked about the, the extended time of it, for example, and you will take some time, probably, hopefully, to revisit that before the exam. But um, at least it should give you, perhaps it should, a few things pop up again to your mind, and you should be able to identify um, at least some of the pros and cons. And that, my plan was to uh, check about first complexity is one of the issues. Like C of the individual approaches, um, the assumptions about the distribution. And then we had do we doubt the approach suffer from linearization issues? Um, what else? Yeah. I know. Flexibility. Discuss what you think is flexible or not flexible. And the ability to build large scale map. That's something we'll discuss. If you think it's a flexible approach, we we'll kind of the idea was to elaborate that a little bit during the discussion now. So this should be more discussion driven. So what about the Kalman filter? How would you rate the Kalman filter? Here? What are what the complexity of the Kalman filter? So what's that? 
squared in the number of um, line marks we have. That's true. Um, depending on the dimensionality of the observation, it can be cubic. It's a matrix inversion, but typically it's dominated by um, um, n squared in the terms where n is the number of landmarks that we have. What is the assumption about the distribution that the common filter does? Just everyone can participate in Gaussian. Um, linearization, I already said that. It's all linear. It's all linear. Oh, yeah. Color filter is even all linear here. Yeah. <coughs> all linear. So that's why the color filter itself is to be unsuited to SLAM because everything is non-linear. Um, flexibility. So what can be flexibility? Five out of ten. Sorry? <laughs> Five out of ten. <laughs> no. So what I mean with flexibility, for example, how easy is it to integrate different sensing modalities? How easy is it to redo a decision that you have done? Why? You add a data, make a data station, and then you identify, oh, that was really stupid. Can you get rid of that, yes or no? No. Yeah, so it's, that's what I mean. The color filter still has some flexibility in terms of adding different um, <coughs> types of observations. You still can incorporate that. Um, but especially the case of, let's say, undoing it, uh, um, a decision is kind of inflexible. So, yeah, let's call it medium. <laughs> And I know that this is kind of a criterion, which is not a strong criterion you may use, but I want you to identify a little bit what are the problems of these approaches and therefore that helps. What about large scale mapping? Really bad. EKF. What about complexity? Exactly. Because the only thing I do, I linearize my um, observation function and my um, emotion. What about the underlying distribution? Also Gaussian. Linearization issues. Do they exist, yes or no? Yes. yes. Uh, we have by this general assumption. Yeah, exactly. I do. There's standard linearization uh, with this Taylor approximation. And the key problem I have in here that I cannot relinearize. So if my initial estimate is very good, this may not be problematic because then the linearization um, should hopefully stay the same unless my filter diverges anyway. Um, so if my initial guess is very good, it's not critical. If my initial guess is far away from the real solution, that, um, um, that can hurt dramatically because I did the wrong linearization, I can't fix it. So let's call this no relinearization. Linearizes but no linearization. Flexibility is also very similar to the, uh, to the regular column filter. Um, and um, large scale mapping is also something, same as here, that typically doesn't work out um, because the quadratic complexity typically prevents you to go to large scale maps. And the other thing is the larger the map is, the more likely it is that you need relinearization. And um, so, these are two things which why it's not a very good idea to do that um, on um, to, to use the approach for large scale mapping. Okay, let's look to the next big block of the site. I mean, the UKF is pretty similar to the EKF. It does the linearization a little bit better because it has kind of the unsuited transform, but so it performs somewhat better than the common filter, extended common filter, but you still cannot relinearize. Once you commit it to that, that's it. But it's, it's very similar to the UK approach, so it's a little bit better. No, the, the, the difference between the EK and the UK are not traumatic. What about the SIF? Complexity. That depends which complexity you refer to. Which complexity do you refer to? Sorry? Isn't it, isn't it linear on Perthes? It's not on it. So I mean, the question is, um, it, it's an online approach, so it don't take the proposed into account and but all the, all the landmarks. Of course, you can just store all the landmarks somewhere, so it's definitely linear in the number of landmarks um, in terms of the storage, but 
the important thing is that the, the time update, so what the amount of time you spend per step, per observation that you get in, and that was constant time. Since we don't have because you only work on these active features and the size of the yeah. active feature set was constant. So it's actually constant time and linear space. Underlying distribution of the cipher. What was the underlying distribution of the cipher? It's not so question because we have the information. Yeah, exactly. You're using the information form, which is a dual form of the um, of regular moment form used for the common filter, so it's also Gaussian. Um, linearization. It's exactly the same. Same as the E here. Yeah. This always means the same as here. So the flexibility is actually exactly the same again. And Ashka mapping. We can perform a bit better because we don't have check units. And also this active uh, landmark. So it's definitely better than the uh, common filter because you can the, the time update is irrelevant from the size of the map. That's a key thing. That's a very, very strong argument for long term mapping, large scale mapping. The problem is here, again, the linearization, which can be critical if you have big errors. So if you have small errors, you can build large maps with this approach. If you have if your the, the ability to not linearize hurts, so to say, then you may run into problems. Okay. Running a little bit out of space at the moment, but um, so what about the particle filter based approach? Let's just take standard fast lens as one of the examples. What the complexity of this approach? Um, it's cubic in the number of dimensions your state space has. Yeah. And I'm saying that because, I mean, it's linear in, 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 um, in space. It's linear in space. Yeah. Uh, of particles you have, but uh, that's not really relevant. Really more relevant is that it's not very well suited to. Uh, no, no, it's not. So power is the power of n, where n is the number of dimensions you have. Yeah, so what we use is um, raw regularization here. So we, we only need to maintain one, the latest pose explicitly in our state space. So we need number of set particles to represent the state space. So it's linear in the number of particles. And the number of particles is sometimes non trivial to estimate or to determine. To be educated guess it's a constant number. It's something a value that doesn't change in most systems. So it's linear in the number of samples that's called the M. How about the features? All the particles have their own maps. So it's actually linear in the number of features in the stupid implementation, naive implementation. Because every particle needs to maintain a copy of all features because they have different positions. We had, however, the idea we just briefly discussed that, that we could use this small data structure, this tree-like data structure, where you copy things only on demand. So if in the um, in the resampling step, you only uh, copy the reference to the tree, and only if you change something in the tree, you make local copies. And you can actually yeah. bring that down to lock yeah. and uh, and it's a number of features. Because it was m multiple n number of the. So m times n is it in the kind of naive implementation if you just have a list of all features for every sample. But if samples can actually share their maps, and you just Make an update of the stuff you change in this tree, or this kind of special binary tree structure there. Um, then you can use it in a lower time. What about the underlying distribution that we have? Sorry about the complexity. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, sorry, what question about that? Yeah. The raw blackberryization doesn't help us with um, the number of of um, the n, the number of features uh, of particles depends on the size of the 
Und die Dimensionalität ist auch ein Safe Space. Es hilft in dem Sinne, dass wir sonst die Probleme zu senden würden. Und das ist der Block, der eine dramatische Dimension hat. Aber die andere Dimension ist eine Konstanz. Also die Dimensionalität des Problems wird nicht groß, während wir es mappen. Also es ist nicht so, dass ich mappe one or two features or a million features, the dimensionality stays the same, so it's constant in the number. But of course, you need to have a certain number of particles, and this depends on the problem. I completely agree with that. What was the other one? No, it's the, the distribution? Yeah. Uh, pick any. That's, that's why. There are no. No. More or less. Not I mean, you're completely right, so the post distribution can be Arbitrary distribution? But for particles, we are representing landmarks at this one, they are EK. Exactly, so landmarks are still EKFs. So um, the pose can be non Gauss, pose can be arbitrary, arbitrary, but the landmarks are still Gaussians. For the past step, so this landmark based past step. Linearization issues. What about that? So for the for the motion of the robot, there's completely no linearization issues in there. So it's really great. We still have the problem you, for the at least for the fast step where we use again this uh, EKS to update the landmarks. Yeah. We have linearization assumptions in there. That's true. But for the grid case, for the we don't have this linearization effect there. So we say pose, no problem. Landmarks could be, but again, there's it's not as bad as for this for the for the Flexibility. Sorry? It's uh, flexible, I think. Could you elaborate on <coughs> your decision a little bit better? <laughs> yeah. you, it's flexible that you can add, have all types of sensors and mm -hmm. all modalities and everything you can ever possibly think of, you can fit in there. Mm -hmm. It's not flexible in undoing decisions. Yep, that's true. Um, there are also some ways that people try to do that by making copies or duplicating samples on the fly if you see you need more decisions, so you can actually duplicate samples if you can make, still maintain that. Also, you can do backups of the filter, easily recover that. So there have been some approaches to do that, but in general, you're completely right with what you said. Um, so I gave the plus in flexibility, someone more flexible than these approaches, but um, still you can't undo data cessation decisions, which becomes more and more important. Um, large scale mapping. Yeah. yeah. Because you have it we have the map and the yeah. mm -hmm. and the um, and articles are uh, online so we know the yeah. So it's definitely a plus. The limitation of the polygon filter in for large scale mapping is to be the uncertainty that the robot can have on its way. So if you go for really large scale maps, you typically need to be able to represent a large positional uncertainty of the filter at some point. So if you first go whatever, to whatever license direction, to the black forest and then return back the first time you re revisit something, you may have accumulated a huge uncertainty in the pose and you need to be able to cover this uncertainty appropriately with samples. That's one of the key limitations of the polygon filter, at least from my point of view, that the uncertainty you can represent is kind of limited. So if you have something which is a motion which is very similar to a Gaussian, the Kalman filter friends, Kalman filter friends may be even better um, in this case because they can represent an arbitrary large uncertainty unless it's Gaussian. If you have, however, um, distributions which are non-Gaussian, then the particle filter is better, but it still has this limitation that you you may need a very, very large number of samples to represent the, the positional uncertainty appropriately. Yes. But um, if, if I use a particle filter to have a very large representation, yeah. that's the same as using a very uh, using a particle filter, the same number of um, particles, to represent the small um, variation, but at the same time, the accuracy on my on how I model my uh, Underlying uh, 
mm -hmm. probability density function is just scale to it, right? That's completely right. That's also one of the criticisms people raise against yes, supporting a filter that it is pretty robust but not that accurate. But it, that's okay. It's not that accurate, but that doesn't depend on the scale. So it's very scale independent. Yes, but I mean th that's true. But um, you one one point you get a factor in which doesn't render completely independent, and that's your observation. How well can you match observations? So when you make data associations. Your, if, you have, if you would scale the sensor and the accuracy of the sensor as well, it would hold what you say, but this is typically not the case. So you have a sensor which has certain pro pro properties, and therefore, um, if you scale it up dramatically, but you don't scale up the sensor, you at some point do not have enough, a densely enough covered particle cloud to have a particle in the right decision to make the appropriate data associations. Therefore, the limitation comes in as you don't scale the observations or the, the sensor properties. But if you could do that, you're absolutely right. I mean, obviously, no, you're, you're right, it doesn't help in that way. Could I, um, I can always upsample the, uh, the density function? You can do that. I mean, the problem cheating. is if you realize that you need to upsample it, it's already too late in most of the cases. Okay, yeah. so that's the issue that we have. Okay, um, graph based approaches. Is there anything else moving? <coughs> Complexity. <coughs> Sums of Gaussians, yes. sum of Gaussian, or we can even different function if we use different cost functions, these robust cost functions. So we have some flexibility in here. The standard least square is equivalent to a Gaussian, but we can choose different cost functions that then allow us to have a different underlying distribution. So we have quite some flexibility in here. Linearization issues. Good. Why good? Because it can deal with the nonlinear stuff with this constraint as with the process and then. So we but we linearize them, right? Yes, but on each iteration you can re um, linearize it. That's the point. We relinearize in every iteration and this is a very strong point. So we take the best current estimate, linearize it, and then recompute that. And so the linearization, just because the map changes dramatically, doesn't ruin our linearization. It's the very important point. Flexibility. Sorry? But you can't undo decisions, right? You can do. Yes, you do remove constraints. Because you'll be trading. How do but you I do remove the you're not removing the constraints, are you? But you can easily do that. So if you have so the first thing is you are quite flexible in the sense of or you find your cost function with the max mixture, you can see that you can select between them, you could also disable that completely. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a lot of flexibility. So the question is how do you make that decision? That's still a little bit unclear on how to identify what's the outlier, what's the right one. But you have a very easy way to do that. You just need to remove the edge from the graph so that's super flexible in this respect. 
Also, you can add different information. You can add completely different constraints between posters and you can add features. So it's a very nice framework for adding all of stuff in there. So it's plus plus of flexibility from my side. Um, large scale mapping. Definitely. Sorry. Definitely. Yeah. Because yeah, I think it's good because we have we mostly uh, with this postgraph we can represent a large scale. What do you think? I'm looking ahead mm -hmm. because there's more coming, and then the last scalability is even better. So uh, the problem is that the as as the graph grows. Um, because each gets ever more complicated, unnecessarily so. That the question is this really the case. So depending if you optimize online, you always have a pretty good solution, and the doesn't get more difficult. But it's definitely the case that your matrix grows and grows and grows with the number of posts you have. So the ability to the large scale is something in the middle. If you don't use a standard approach, there are however ways where you can do that quite well. So this requires approximations that you can do on the way. You may can freeze parts of the graph. You can merge nodes together. If you have a constraint, you can actually merge nodes to avoid creating new edges. So different ways of it we haven't talked about here, um, but to make that actually quite well applicable to large scale mapping. But the standard approach, grows linearly, can be good, but maybe you run out of space at some point in time. It will happen as you continue. But they actually wait for fixing that you're doing approximations that you can do with that. We're running a little bit out of time. Sorry for that. Where do you see all the issues? In that thing. I mean you already mentioned one last time that when the environment changes. Yeah environment changes are one of the big things that are unsolved. So there are a few approaches as trying to estimate what is dynamics so of filtering out people walking through the scene, cars driving through um, partially an EM based approach to say is this dynamic, if this is dynamic then the world will look like this. Other things that are is um, systematically changing environments. So typical configuration that occurs. So you have dynamic, you have changes, but the changes follow a certain pattern. There have been approaches proposed for doing clustering of local maps or modeling what changes, how that changes, which parts change, but it's still an open research issue, so it's not it's definitely not solved yet. Also the question is with how many dynamic changes can we actually deal? So we, if we have a lot of changes, the whole world change completely. So I, I leave that building, I re-enter the building in the meanwhile they reconstruct the whole building. It's really hard to do that. Um, but um, the question is always with how many changes can you deal with? And um, if you can deal with too many changes, it's always likely that you make wrong data associations because you say, hey, that looks kind of similar. 50% of that room looks similar to the room where I've been last time. But either the room has changed and I'm in the same room or I'm simply a different room. So there's always a balance between those two things. Um, what else? What else do you imagine? Yeah. Uh, check, uh, sharing information. Sharing information is one of the things. So if you have robots which have exactly the same setup, they can typically share stuff. But if you have different sending modalities, different centers, oh. it's quite a challenge to how to make robots share things. Also, yes. how to share, how to share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's say if you share map structure, for example, that's already. You have one of the world map, you can't share that. Sorry? If you have a map of the whole world, how are you going to share, share that? No, but he, so this is one thing just from the amount of data, but you can also see that from the sending capabilities. You have one robot with a laser scan and one with a camera. Can they exchange information? How can they, of course they can copy the data to the other reader, but how can they exploit that? This becomes more and more relevant if you think about robots that are deployed in spaces. So given that we have OpenStreetMap data, how can we exploit OpenStreetMap data, for example, to build a robot that navigates through the theme? Because we have a map at a completely different structure and not related to the sensor information that the robot sees necessarily. How can we actually exploit that to avoid the super complex RAM problem of mapping a whole city or whole whole state or whatever with the robot. So these are also open questions. How can we exploit background information to do that? And related to that, we always said that large scale mapping, long term mapping. What happens if the robot doesn't just do a one hour mapping run, but it just maps whenever it's on? How can we do with live one mapping? We call that. So we have to make approximations. We have only a certain amount of computational resources. And how can we do the best with the resources we have? How is the lifelong mapping different than systematic changing environments? 
Um, it also depends that you, uh, so this is strongly, strongly related, but additionally it's the case that you simply always accumulate data. Um, so linear complexity will screw you up at some point. And so you have just your notebook, everything used to be computed in the notebook. At some point in time there was more information in there that you can use, so you need to throw away something and make decisions on what to maintain, what to discard, what to forget, and these things. Um, failure recovery is also one of the issues. What happens if the robot realizes that it made a failure? How can it actually recover from that? It's also something which is kind of relevant. And I think these are really the most important open issues that I also came up with, uh, which are currently, or things which are currently under investigation. Um, so these are kind of more or less things to discuss. All online approaches to see it as well. So we want to have systems where the robot can actually complete the map instantaneously, or more or less instantaneously, so that it can make navigation decisions based on the map. What do you mean by exploiting prior knowledge? So something like this on street map data. So there's prior information that is somehow available. How can we actually exploit that and, um, and make, it, make it useful for the robot and let it combine that with its own sensor information? How to build a sensor model for laser if you want street map data? It's pretty unclear. It's so like you have a map on this scratch and then give it to a reverse. Yeah, or I mean even <coughs> if you have to consider you have a wireless connection, which is not bad assumptions. Or GSM connection or whatever, you can simply query the OpenStreetMap data on, of, of your local surrounding. How can you actually use this information? It's something which is interesting. Um, okay, there are also some what I call sensor related issues. How to do efficient data stations depending on the sensor. How to deal with more crappier sensor, more crappy sensors, because the crappier sensors, the cheaper it is, and in the end, robots need to be cheap if you want to sell them. How can you work with a camera which has only four pixels? So this vacuum cleaner I showed in the first course is evolution robotic system. In the end, use a camera with four pixels, which looks to the ceiling um, to do their slam. Of course, it doesn't work in really large scale scenes, but so how can you do this with really, really crappy sensors? It's also one of the big challenges because these sensors are super cheap. Just a few cents. It's nice if you want to put a laser scanner worth 4,000 to 5,000 euros in a robot, no one would buy the vacuum cleaner if it's 5,000 euro only the sensor. So you need to be able to deal with bad sensors or sensor limitations. Um, one of the things are poorly structured scenes. This holds for cameras if you have no textures. It holds for laser scanners if you have identically looking scenes. Um, if you have vision, you have missing light. It's difficult. You can bring your own light source, but if you bring your own light source, you also have effects that by moving the light source, the scene looks differently. And data stations can get it. And also a monocular slam, so monocular camera slam, um, where it's hard to get the scale in. And so it, it works quite well for for like room sized environments. Systems are available, but for large scale environments it's pretty tricky and also not a soft issue. At least from my point of view. You always sometimes see these nice videos where people show cool stuff with one camera, but whenever you try them and try them really on a robot where it's bumpy and everything, it's quite hard to actually use this information reliably. Okay, some advertisement. Next term, introduction to mobile robotics. Um, the course so for those of you on the first semester. Um, that may be relevant for you, of course. At least if you like the course here, it's maybe worth attending that one. Um, for those of you who already are in the second or uh, fourth semester, they probably have heard that course already. Yeah. Isn't mobile robotics, interactive mobile robotics, the course before this course? Um, that was actually designed like that, so if, depending on how you study, you just which time you start. Um, but I tried to make the course actually, I mean, and rely on a few concepts, but these kind of uh, two lectures I, I, I did a sub from the robotics one course, which was base filter introduction and uh, the sensor on motion models, which are in more detail covered in the mobile robotics course. But um, this, if you haven't heard the course, I strongly suggest to attend that course. What are you teaching? Um, so it starts um, different types of sensors, robot motion, um, go more into details about the models you have, um, you grip mapping a little bit more, or in more detail, um, then histogram filters, Common filter that will come up for localization then. Um, you need to do some exploration, um, 3D map, 3D map acquisition, how to represent 3D environments for grids, um, information driven approaches, how to combine mapping, exploration, localization, solve everything at the same time. So there's a little bit of overlap with that course, um, but these are just a few lectures and there's more, more stuff uh, to do. The course will be Monday and Tuesdays. Uh, Tuesdays from the middle of the 12th, the exercise of so three hours teaching, three hours course plus one hour exercise. Yeah, that's 
not really related, but is there also a general robotics course that discusses kinematics and those kind of things? Um, so there was last year a course on a guest lecture on model manipulation and grasping side by Jeff Trinkle. Mm -hmm. um, he's not here anymore. So um, there's not that much of kind of whatever manipulators here at Fiber. Okay. Any further questions about that? Yeah. You are doing this course? Or? Uh, so we're doing it jointly. So I will teach, Wolfram Bogart will teach, Maren Benevitz will teach, Wolfram Bogart, Maren Benevitz, and myself are the main lecturers mm -hmm. um, of the course. Um, it's quite likely that um, due to Pauli and Chandra Spinello from all that, from all that, I will actually also contribute to that. So to be do the introduction to all our robotics course in a shared way because um, it avoids some friction between groups that you say, um, Everyone was interested in the students who like robotics, and so the standard course is often shared too. That you at least to know, get to know the, pe the different people who are potential supervisors, for example, for thesis you see in the course in this area of robotics. Um, it's also kind of the idea why there are several um, lectures. Um, I will very briefly talk about the course evaluation, which I first have to say a big thank you. It was a really nice to see the evaluations. Um, they kind of just have rough statistics which I generated for at least a few topics from the um, Excel file summary I got uh, from the from, from Edit, uh, Friday. So learning achievement was pretty good, that's actually something I like. So you were kind of content, or mostly content with what you learned, you had the feeling that you learned something, which I um, highly appreciate. Um, in terms of the, uh, if the material was too difficult or um, completely fine, so half of them said, find something with it to hide this. I don't have the, the sheet, so I cannot look that up, but I guess it's also partly correlated which semester you are in the first semester you're more likely to be on that side if you're in, if you were later on in your studies you may be more likely to be here on that side than at least my guess. Um, it's always kind of a balance you try to achieve. Um, and I'm completely happy with this with this outcome. So <laughs> depending on if it's high you also learn a little bit more and, uh, yeah so that's that's also pretty good. Um, connections to other courses will be a little more um, distributed. I try to sometimes point a little bit out what are other things. On the other hand, I try to design the course in a way that you don't need prior information. So you, it's helpful to have attended the introduction to mobile robotics course, but it was definitely not a prerequisite, and I tried to um, make it a kind of self-containing course. Um, and therefore, I didn't point out too many connections to other courses. But all fine. Central of three is here. It's quite. Also, thanks a lot for that. Um, also, the quality of slides and material, everyone was pretty happy. I also appreciate that. Um, and so, I also, so how helpful is this question whether to provide this add on material in terms of the PDF files which are there? That I always provide references to the original material. Um, did you actually use that quite often, or is this, did you only look to the book, or what are the kind of the main sources that you use? It's something which is interesting for me. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Just go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I think that uh, I didn't. I didn't look into the papers, but maybe I will in the preparation yep. for the exam. And I look once into the book when I find that some part was not so clear to yep. me, like mathematically or yep. not so clear. Then I put it book. But also just once. Okay. Yeah. Um, the book was more helpful. Okay. So knowing the exact chapter, chapter you're referring to, yep. that's quite useful. I did know they were there at the papers. And I think I looked at one or maybe two, but I didn't like read the whole paper. Yeah, but there's also not. It's not necessary that you read that, but these were my partially the stuff in the Progress Robotics book. Actually, that's very useful. With quite a significant amount of that, but of course not everything. It looks also now two years old, so some newer things which are definitely not in there, and therefore I edit the other stuff. So whenever you stuff me, say this was super helpful or. I only learn based on the, on the slides or only based on the course. It's also helpful to know that on how much material you especially put on the slides. So I often try to make the slides not, not too dense um, because it's easier to give these completely packed slides. I dislike that a little bit. Um, on the other hand, people only learn using the slides. May something be, sometimes be a little bit too little information on that. So if you have any feedback on that, just just let me know how to improve that. I'm happy to hear any suggestions. Um, quality of explanations, I was also very happy with that. Um, also, again, I mean, one of the topics I'm working in since a couple of years, so I know quite a little bit about that, and, but one, I'm happy that I was actually able to communicate that to you, that you understood that, all of the responses to questions. 
was uh, similarly also quite happy with that. Thank you very much for that. Difficulty of the exercises it was nice, so it was kind of actually met uh, quite well on what uh, you should do. As I said before, we tried to design them in a way that could, in could focus on the interesting stuff and uh, the framework is kind of provided. Also, tutorials are a good addition to the lecture. Um, I also see that perfectly, uh, or this was actually designed for tutorial. More hands-on than theoretical things this year, or compared to some other courses, uh, but I think that you learn a lot of things when you actually code them on your, on your own, and that's kind of something I, I regard as helpful, also it always helped me in the past, like whatever I implemented, I actually understood quite well, and also kept it in memory for several years, and didn't vanish after half a year. Um, so explanations of the tutorials are helpful. Also, really appreciate that. Um, I think both invested quite some time, and uh, I appreciate it. What I liked, so I kind of just picked a few of the free text comments in there. So because also some of them kind of um, mismatch with the dislikes, which come next. At least one or two. So slides and material and recordings were kind of nice. Also, a lot of people said that they like the YouTube recordings. Um, with, the, with the camera, although they're pretty big, I think it also a nice way of recording the person standing here instead of just the electronic recordings or, or cantata recordings. Um, intermediate feedback, um, also I try to address the things, at least some of the feedback I got, um, I try to incorporate that. Um, and yeah, so some people said, for example, no boring programming framework, uh, framework programming, which is nice. Um, and um, on the other hand, other people said I dislike, I would like to program everything, although it might be complicated. So some of the people want to do everything, some of the people said it's nice to have focus on the important things. I think for the course as a, total, as a whole, it's better to focus only on the interesting parts, because otherwise a lot of people actually drop out because they're not interested, or don't do the exercise because they're not interested in all the programming framework. Um, and therefore, we, it was an explicit design choice to, to make that. Um, I would have to have better testing strategies so that the program works correctly. We try to address this a little bit, at least providing you the results. Um, yeah, there may become space for improvements to provide some intermediate solutions or what you should get out um, as something which you may consider for the next term. Really if some easier ways for testing if some of the components work or not. Um, I don't feel like the exercises prepared me well for the exam, um, more non programming exercises. Um, I think that programming actually helps a lot because you really understand the material and um, if you understand the material, the questions are... And what, 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 we, what I try to ask in the exercise are really stuff, have you understood what's going on? And uh, not that much derive whatever ABC that typically never happens. Um, so it's more like, I really want to know if you understood it, do you know how these procedures work and what are the advantages, what are the design decisions which have been made in order to achieve that? So. Um, I think they prepare quite well, um, but of course it's a subjective view from myself. And I hope you see that differently um, after the course. Um, so what could be improved? <coughs> I would like to see more examples on how the theory fits to the final implementation and what are the most common pitfalls. Um, yeah, that's partially hard to realize if you, to teach that if you don't work in the course with an implementation, but um, I try to identify actually what are the advantages and disadvantages of the individual techniques, but um, yeah, I'm not sure how to address this in a much better way. Uh, if you have any feedback on that, I'm um, happy to do that. Some people would like to have more parts of introduction and its conclusions, so more discussing how the stuff actually fits into the course. Um, it's always kind of a trade off on how much time you have to do that. If I would extend the course, for example, to a 3 plus 1 course instead of 2 of 2, that may be an option to do that. but. Even I had more material I wanted to put into the course, but definitely left it aside. But um, yeah, discuss more research questions. This was only done the last course year. Um, that's something which we could integrate more into the course. So after each chapter, watch all the key things. But I also like to have the discussion more in the end, so kind of an outlook, because we kind of learned the foundations now and kind of what are the what are the open issues. All in all, thank you very much, and I really appreciate that. I really like the course. We'll definitely teach it again uh, every winter term. And uh, from now on, and so yeah, thanks. Well, the first experiment. Thank you very much for everything. I really, really, really like that. Big thank you to you. <laughs> Last but not least, what topics did you miss? Of course, missing always means you need to kick out something else. 
There's no, and you can add new stuff. I want to know more about this, more about this. If you have a suggestion on what you would like to hear, also tell me what did you, what should we take out. And well, if you ever have any feedback, I'm happy to just take it into account. So, from the open issues, so yeah. because because especially towards the end, you did do really stuff. I mean, that, like that. Um, mixture model that's okay. that's paper from last year, so that's yeah. very new. Yeah. Um, I like that, and I think maybe something on moving objects or yeah, moving so objects. dynamics, dynamic scenes, dynamic scenes um, would be really cool to have. What you should kick out? Um, sparse extended information filter, because it's not. It's, I don't see how it's. I mean. It was actually not used that much anymore. So it was published on page 4 to 5. It didn't found the big uptake in the community. Um, but it has, the nice thing is that it actually, or why I regard as relevant, because it was one of the approach which used the, the common filter, all the properties of the common filter, which are kind of well, very well studied, um, and extended in a way that it became a constant time algorithm, and there are not that many constant time approaches available. So from this point of view, I regard as kind of nice, it also ways that you can quite easily share information between robots and actually fuse information between different sources because you work in information form. It has some nice properties where, and as a result of that, I would tend to not discard the, the site because I think it's a relevant building block which has been uh, which has been proposed as nice properties, although it's not that frequently used, so I completely agree with that. So if you look at the number of slam algorithms you find online, if, I'm not sure if there's actually an open source site. Um, if you don't want to drop scythe, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. you can keep it in. It's, it's not yeah, bad yeah, because yeah. you ask for something to drop instead of yeah. something else. Uh, at the beginning, you did the base stuff and all the basic stuff, which I knew before because I, I had taken a course similar to introduction to mobile robotics. Yeah. And also, base comes up in every second lecture on that something related to probabilistic yeah. stuff. So, could have dropped that from. What about UK? Personal. What about UK? No. Because this is something I would discard <coughs> because it's just a small add-on to the common filter. Did you like that, the UK? Do you want to keep that? Or? Um, I, that's why I thought about telling you stuff you get, but no, because it is theoretically more sound. It, it's, it has better approximation than the EKF. Mm -hmm. It's not used at all anywhere. I oh, think actually, there are there a couple of EKFs in the But so EKF. I've heard more often, yep. although the UKF is easier in the way you implement it and in the way... Well, there are a couple of UKF implementations out Yeah, but, sure. but e so, so EKF and UKF comes up more first. That's how you present it, yep. that's how everyone else presents it. But actually it's slightly easier, the, the UKF is slightly easier from concept and from yeah. realization, but you don't have to do in realization. <coughs> but so that's why I should, we should keep it in. Okay. Yeah, I, also think that <coughs> I, I find, I, I'm not sure if I remember correctly, but also I, as I remember, we didn't really spend so much time on the UKF because it was also yeah. so long. So I don't think, no, if, like even if you kick it out, how much space you really get for yeah. everything else. Because it's not too late. Yeah. I also think about this side, I think for me it's like, um, I think the key question is whether, so also the mass behind with the information mm -hmm. matrix, whether you want people to learn that or not, because I think it was just for the site, right, that we needed it. Yeah, yeah. So if you, if yeah. you don't go for the site, you also don't need the extended information for them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, so I think this is the key question, whether you think people will, or one of the questions, whether you think people will learn this information matrix thing yeah. in this example, and whether you want to. But my thing is why you also need the information matrix, why it's helpful, because it comes up as the H matrix in the gauss newton again. So to okay. kind of see the, also that these approaches are kind of related with each other, it's kind of, why I also, at least you should have heard about the content of the information matrix at some point. Okay, so then good luck for the exam. And uh, yeah, again, thank you very much, Steve.